Magicians, welcome back to Magic TV. My name's Craig. It is nine o'clock, which means it's time for a Talk Magic. And I am here today uh, with somebody who's been around for a long time, but has recently kind of really made a name for himself by partnering up with the 1914 D. Christopher and Jack Curtis, uh, an incredible mentalist and the person behind what I think is the best, absolute best download on learning how to perform on stage. I am, of course, talking about the one and only Alexander Marsh. How are you doing, Alex? Are you okay? I'm great. How are you doing? I'm excited. I'm excited <laughs> to have a real mentalist on the channel. You know, <laughs> I am a real mentalist. If only Ken Jeremy Cambridge didn't have that title already, then I would use it. <laughs> you know, I've, I've had some of the fake guys that do magic and they dabble in mentalism. You know, those guys like uh, yeah. Spellman. But I mean, you, oh, you're the real deal. I mean, you're, you're a real mentalist. I'm so super excited. <laughs> Thank you. Yeah, I do. Yeah, you're right. Actually, I do only focus on mentalism. Like we were chatting briefly just before about a routine I have out called Transfer, and it's a magic trick and a mentalism trick. Uh, but I didn't know it was a magic trick until a magician said, "Hey, you could do a magic trick with that." I was like, "Oh yeah, that's a good idea." <laughs> just doesn't enter my brain. I just do mentalism. Well, you know what? I, I, I we're talking about Transfer, which is a thing that you can get as a download on Penguin Magic. Mm -hmm. What I love is all of the live performances they include, is you doing it as a magic trick. And I'm like, didn't, didn't imagine Alexander Marsh doing a, doing a Bills Across routine as a download, but there you go. It was pretty nerve wracking because that's kind of probably the first time I've professionally performed magic. Like I can do, I could do a pretty good, you know, ambitious card and stuff just on my own or to my son or something. But that's probably the first time I've done magic and it mattered with those cameras and lights pointing at me. <laughs> You pulled it off. You did great. <laughs> but, but, but outside of that one thing, you are obviously primarily a mentalist. And, uh, and, and what's interesting about this, and just to clear this up at the beginning, a lot of magicians and mentalists that are watching this, they know you as Alexander Marsh, but you also, uh, you also go by the name of Alex McAleer. Yes. And I believe Alexander Marsh is for anything to do with product development, while Alex McAleer is more to do with you as a professional performer to lay people. Is that right? Or That's exactly right, yeah. So Alex McAleer is my real name. It's also the name I perform under. But when I started like to publish things many, many years ago, I kind of thought, should I have a, should I have a pen name? And uh, it was actually talking to Spellman, Mark Spellman, at some convention or other. He said, and this is before he was Mark Spellman from BGT and that other BGT, um, he just said he wished he he wished he'd done it because he put out those DVDs years ago now with Alex Zam under his name Mark Spellman. It's a very unique name, and he was telling me about he was at a gig. I might be misremembering this, but he was at a gig like a corporate that he'd done year after year. So he's quite popular. People knew who he was, and then someone came up to him afterwards and was like, "Great, another great show, Mark." Um, I saw you've got like a whole DVD set out. I bought it actually, and he was like, "Oh no!" <laughs> <laughs> just trying to remember have I done any of that material in these shows. So yeah, it made me think uh, pen name's best. So I just took Alexander, which is my full first name, added Marsh at the end, which is uh, just a name from my family, a family name that's not my name, but yeah. Perfect, well that's great. And I wanna talk more about you publishing material, but I wanna start, for those people that don't know you, I wanna start right at the very beginning. Um, what got you into mentalism? It's, it's kind of a weird, I know you're a full-time mentalist. Did mm. you start off, getting into magic as a kid what's your what's your origin story how did you um, get this wonderful wonderful kind of world <laughs> of deception yeah playing with envelopes and bits of card. um i sort of liked magic as a child but i'm uh, was and i'm still i guess an only child so i had loads of hobbies like i wanted to be a cartoonist i wanted to be a ventriloquist i wanted to be also a special effects man uh, like I even built with my dad back when Robot Wars was big in the period, we we made a robot. Like we knew a special effects guy locally. He's the guy that used to make Brum and stuff for Rosie and Jim and stuff. He lived locally, so he helped us build it. Never got on the TV show, but it was cool. Really wanted to do special effects, but then I just kind of like anything. You become a teenager and you get less interested in that. You want to go out and, and get drunk in a field, you know. <laughs> so um, I got less and less interested. And it was Darren Brown appearing on television in. 1999 year 2000 or something i was sort of into magic and weird stuff and before that my dad oh, had bought me how old were you at this point by the way oh uh like uh 15 something like that 15 16 because my so uh, when i was 14 my mother passed away so then i just sort of 
became very depressed and a bit insular, didn't really go to school anymore. My dad was like trying to help me out a bit. And he bought me a book of, of memory tricks. It was just called Maximize, no, it wasn't Maximize Your Memory, something like that. Ironically, I've forgotten the title. <laughs> <laughs> but it had like mnemonic tricks in it and stuff like that. And at the back, it recommended other books, which were uh, like Harry Lorraine's books and some were magic books and stuff. And I was like, oh, that's interesting. And then um, I just remember my dad saying to me, oh, it's a, like a psychology magic show on E4. And I think you'd probably like it. It's pretty good. So I turned it on. It's like Mind Control 1, the special. I was like, this is great. So went online, found some information, bought those books. And then I sort of found out it wasn't all really psychology. It was this other stuff. I was like, oh, yeah, I used to like magic. Uh, I think I probably got back into magic as well when David Blaine was around. Mm -hmm. Like, I didn't know it was called the Ambitious Card Routine. I called it the Fruit Loops Routine because he does it. And that guy's called Fruit Loops and he signs it Fruit Loops. And that little thing that goes boop to the top. Yeah. <laughs> Which is now just a standard thing. But yeah, I just kind of super got into mentalism then. And as a child growing up in like in a small, small town, big village, which will make sense to UK people watching this, but like imagine a tiny town for any Americans watching. We're like an amateur dramatics society which both my parents were members of. And because I was a kid, I was in a lot of the pantomimes and stuff. And then as I got older, I was the only young male, really. So I just got all the roles. I got the hero. I got the, the Billy Bumpkin, the Buttons character in the pantomimes or any plays. So I really liked performing and being on stage. And that also means there's, a, there's people in those kind of societies who like writing their own stuff, putting on little one-act plays or radio plays. So they put those on. And then one day, uh, a guy who's in charge of it or Alan said, Alex, you should get up and do some of your um, mind magic stuff. Just put together like 20 minutes of stuff. I was like, yeah, I could do that. Put it in the Austin DVD, looked at that, looked at this, looked at that, put together a show. And thinking about the show now, the show is just me showing a series of different sized envelopes. That's <laughs> what the <this> show was. <laughs> I did Austin's bank night, which are really long, thin envelopes. And then I did. Cassidy's three envelope test, different envelope. And then I did a prediction at the end, which was in an envelope. I also did a drawing duplication, which was in a big padded envelope. Just a series of envelopes is all that show was. <laughs> um, and it's terrifying, but I loved it. And because uh, you know, when you'll know this, and many magicians watching this, when you first start performing magic, people love it because the tricks are good. So you immediately get the immediate feedback of like, people really like this. I must be really good. <laughs> and then you start to hopefully work out that the performance is the element and then all that sort of stuff. But yeah, it just kind of started from there. And then I started doing actual gigs. I remember reading in a newspaper that Dynamo got a loan from the Prince's Trust to help him start up. And I think that's why he bought that first camcorder with to make his first TV special. So there was a Prince's Trust in uh, Ipswich, which is near where I grew up. And uh, yeah, got a tiny loan of like 900 pounds or something like that. So I paid back in five pound increments for a number of years, I think. But it meant I could buy a website, buy a suit, <laughs> get some business cards printed. They gave me my first proper gig, which was a good gig and a good quote. That means my first, uh, the first money I was paid for a gig is from um, uh, the Queen's Bank. I can't think what it's called right now. The big one. Uh, I was going to say checkers. It's not checkers. But yeah, I've got the little top of the invoice, the check, because my first one was there. That's cool. Yeah, the kind of bank you can only have if you have bajillions of pounds and you are the queen. So yeah, that was pretty cool. And then, you know, just did a lot of close-up stuff, a lot of weddings and parties, and then occasionally after dinner shows. It just kind of grew from there. I find that there's, it's more difficult to find gigs as a mentalist. Were you billing yourself right from the very beginning as a mentalist? Because yes. I've spoken to other mentalists and they've said, oh, it's a bit of a struggle at the beginning because when people are searching on Google or they're searching somewhere, they're thinking of a magician, very few people think of a mentalist. And so you kind of get passed over especially in the early days. And also as a magician, you can go into a restaurant or you can do kids parties to get your, uh, you know, to get to kind of get your feet wet and get your flight time. Whilst yeah. as a mentalist, it, it's more difficult to, to find that sort of thing. Did you find the same thing or was that, was that? Um, for you? Well, I was coming into it sort of cold. I didn't know any magicians really. Like I met some people at the Ipswich Magic Society. There was a nice bunch of people there. And, um, but I didn't, I didn't know if it was difficult or hard. I never occurred to me that I should, 
I build myself as a magician. I, it was back in the day where everything was psychological magic, a psychological magician. So that probably helped if you put those keywords in there. But I found it actually helped, certainly back then, because Darren Brown was becoming part of the furniture on TV. So everyone knew that this is just a different style of magic. So there's the guys that do the boxes, there's the guys with tigers, there's the guys that do psychological stuff, there's the guys that bend spoons. It was quite, it, people knew that it was a thing. And I found that when I started to do, you know, get on the books of entertainment agencies and stuff like that, you know, London bookers or all around the UK, um, they'd often book multiple magicians. I'm sure you've been as part of a team and they don't want three of the same type of magician because they know that, you know, those three are going around the table putting a, a piece of plastic in people's hands over and over again and doing the same sort of material, which is solid material. So they want different people. So I'd often be booked as the one that's different. So there might be a magician and an iPad magician and me as a mentalist. And in fact, I did a gig once in London and there were two very well-known magician performers uh, who I, one of which I know as a mentalist, we know them as a mentalist, but they also do magic as well. But uh, he said, what are you doing? What are you doing? What kind of magic are you doing? I said, oh, I'm just doing mentalism. Went, really? Like it's so loud. How are you gonna do it? I was like, I'll just struggle through. But he did sort of mental magic -y things, but I was doing drawing duplications and, and billet work and, and swami work and that sort of stuff. Well, that's going to be my next question, actually, which proves that you're a mentalist. <laughs> <laughs> you said you said at the beginning that, uh, you know, you, when you first started gigging, it was a lot of close up magic. And yes. uh, sorry, it was a lot of close up performing. Um, I'm not a mentalist by any stretch of the imagination. At best, I do some mental magic. But one thing that I've found is mentalism is a lot more presentationally or patter based like you can be a magician and be very flash and and be very kind of dynamo and say very little and have the magic speak for yourself yeah you do that as a mentalist so did you find that trick selection as a close-up mentalist is difficult to kind of find or was that not an issue and when you're going into those louder environments how do you cope uh, like uh, because I've been to those Christmas parties those corporate Christmas <laughs> parties where I just I'm literally just lighting flash paper and producing coins <laughs> just dropping stuff yeah exactly yeah and, yeah and I can't imagine how you do that as a mentalist it was really difficult I think at the beginning it was a lot of weddings that I was doing and quieter events like it would say I would always eventually I realized it's too noisy for me to be able to do that most events you know uh so I probably talked myself out of some gigs in the early days. But you're right, material choice is, was, is and was a nightmare. It's like, because also I didn't have a background in magic or performing magic or know any close-up magicians really back then. I didn't know that, um, you know, there's, like most magicians, I assume there are maybe 10 things on you that you could do. I mean, a lot of it's with a deck of cards or whatever, a lot of it's visual and flashy. But I just, I'd only do drawing duplications, usually with a wallet or something like that. Some billet work because I'm a billet guy really. Uh, I have a good sort of peek in various ways of like getting someone to think, look at a card and then I can tell them what it is or do an invisible deck which I know you have a lot of work on but just doing it as a straight prediction. Um, but I have different versions of each so one could be 30 seconds long and one could be like a full like 10 minute routine if the table were if it's quiet enough and the table really like it and just swami stuff you super quick but you're right it was really difficult people can't hear you can't engage I've got a very soft posh voice as well and that just disappears especially if the saxophone player is there you know <laughs> so it was it was a real struggle so I did try to push myself more towards after dinner shows or you know parlor shows where you're not necessarily on a platform you're around a big table there's 10 20 people around a table and I do a show as best I can in that environment um but yet yeah, I think even now there's a lot of just if you're just solidly doing mentalism the material is there's not much out there especially when I started as well the only thing that's out there is sort of Mark Striving's doing very 90s mentalism you know very simple little things which probably would have worked in the 90s in those environments in the US but when you start going to London and it's a big corporate event and it's very noisy and it's Christmas and essentially you're between them and the bar <laughs> like you're not going to have a good time but yeah, it was a real struggle. Uh, but I was quite proud of the fact that I just did mentalism. I never sort of said, hey, sign this card and put it, as you can see, it goes in the middle and then you snap your finger and it comes to the top. <laughs> I never, I never, not stooped that low. That's what I was, I was gonna, but, well, you know, did you ever find, me. 
you mentioned about how you got rid of gigs or you talked yourself out of gigs at the beginning. Mm-hmm. Did you ever kind of think to yourself, you know what? It'd be so much easier if I could just crack out that ambitious card again. Oh, absolutely. Like I see magic stuff now. Like the, uh, your review the, a little while ago now of um, the Rubik's Cube and it goes inside a glass jar. I haven't got the foggiest how it works. <laughs> but I, I, that, I see tricks like that and I go, God, I wish I did magic. Oh, I'd love to do that for someone and see them just go oh or like um uh, another one from 1914 the prohibition monty i saw that i was like god if i did magic i'd 100 percent be doing that at every table as i went around but yeah occasionally i did think oh, i should just do magic or something but i don't have a presentation or a hook or any anything like that it would just look like a man doing a bunch of procedures to make a thing work mm-hmm. look at the flash paper there's a there's a chain <laughs> it would be really simple and I suppose there's a lesson to be learned there, which is know what you, you, you know what you're, I don't want to say capable of, because that's not right, because mm. I know you could probably be very capably a magician if you wanted to. But I suppose it's, it's all about, you love mentalism, you mm. always love mentalism, so that's what you're focused on and you haven't ever gone in another direction, even though it would be easy for you to do that. Yeah, exactly, yeah. It kind of meant as well. And then eventually... I just started doing more stage work. Like I started working in the cabaret world. Cabaret and burlesque shows were becoming very popular a few years ago. And uh, normally it used to be like for a variety show on stage somewhere, it would be, you'd have all different variety and maybe one burlesque act. But then sort of a few years ago, 10 years ago, maybe it was, it's all burlesque with two variety acts. And my partner's a circus performer as well. So she has like a hula hoop act. You have a couple of double acts that aren't, that aren't mentalism or, or magic or uh, anything like that, kind of side show. So I just started working more in that. So I just became more of a stage performer over time. I took a show to the Edinburgh Fringe and then Champions of Magic happened. And then it just, now I'm just a stage performer. <laughs> I want to talk about the stage side of things. I really do. But before I do, let me ask you one other question. In the early days, you said that your influence was Darren Brown. But then you said your first show, you were doing a lot of Richard Austin and stuff and, and, and so on and so forth. Did did you struggle to find your own style? One thing that I've found, it comes, it's with magic as well. Mm. But I seem to see it a lot with mentalists, which is, okay, that guy is Max Maven. That guy is Darren Brown. That guy yeah. is Richard Osterman. And they haven't developed their own character or their own persona. Um, they're just parroting what they've seen on the DVD and they've just kind of took that on on themselves. Was that an, uh, was that an issue for you in the early days? And can you give any advice for mentalists and magicians that are watching this? Because I know now, having seen you perform, your style is so different to any other mentalist I've seen. I, I said off camera, and I'll say it again now, your delivery, I'm, I'm, you remind me a little bit of Joe Lysett. If Joe Lysett did man, man, <laughs> mentalism, it would be you. And I mean that so complimentary. No, I take it so, as well. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, 100% I was Darren Brown, clone. Because also I liked his, he was so especially in the early days when he was still a bit more mysterious. So enigmatic, he's this guy and he's dressed his old fashioned dish and he collects taxidermy and weird things and you know. But absolutely, I was a Darren Brown clone. Even if I look at videos, even if I watch a video from something I did two months ago and it's new material, I can feel myself slipping back into uh, how I think it should look. And you just kind of pull from examples that you've seen. Also, you pull from more examples as you watch more stuff. So that first show when I was doing Osterlund's, um bank night from those uh, mind mysteries dvds i just did it word for word the same basically didn't have any original jokes did the whole thing about the number five times this week everyone's picked number two i just did exactly the same but that is how you learn i think people you know people get chastised for new magicians or people, uh, older magicians looking at newer people kind of chastise them for copying and like these days it's all tiktok magic done straight here like this and we're all kind of copying each other it's all bright colors good looking and all this popping music and stuff, all kind of copying each other. But you just do it over time, you sort of work out who you are over time and having the stage time. You mentioned the term flight time, which I love. I, I know of it from Mark Paul, I'm not sure if it's just a general term, but it's to do with pilots, isn't it? And the more experienced pilot is the better pilot. The longer you've been in the air flying a plane, that's the pilot who's more senior to the other one. Makes sense. The more you've been on stage, the more you've been performing, then uh, you start to develop your own personality. And also, it's, I'm a big comedy fan. I always have been. Like I used to fall asleep watching videos of like Eddie Izzard or Billy Connolly or the old bottom shows. And I used to love, 
I still love comedy. Like I love the Netflix specials and stuff. Like uh, Joe Lysett is hilarious. So it's that, and being in the cabaret environment, it meant I had to have a handheld microphone. So I started to adopt this stand-up comedian style, uh, you know, uh, attitude. But my jokes weren't jokes. Sometimes I say something funny. I like making audience laugh. I say something funny. But my big joke is the end of the trick. It's the denouement of the. It's predicted here, or you're thinking of this. And as soon as I realized that, it means I could sort of play and, and develop my own personality and sort of let it be free. Like in the stagecraft, um, the art of stagecraft in 1914, I do sort of talk about that a bit and things you can do with friends and non-friends and performers and non-performers to help you find out who you are. But I think on that, I say, I did that. I asked people and friends, like, what am I like? And they said, funny and shy. That was the two main things that came up. Like I'm a very shy person. I thought, well, shyness, that's not good. If you're on stage, if you'd be like, hi, could you just, uh, yeah, thank you. That's no good. So trying to squash that, be a bit more confident. Who's confident that I like? So Joe Lysa has this extraordinary energy, doesn't he? Or so, uh, Eddie Izzard as well, he's just very calm. He just has this confidence about him. Billy Connolly as well, he can just hold the room's attention. So try and find that in myself. And the funniness turn that up even more. So if I'm quippy and, and funny and witty, then bring that onto the stage, you know. And if I say something funny this night, I'll remember it for the next time because that'll definitely happen again in the future. Um, but yeah, it's just any advice for people trying to find their own voice, as they say, it's perform more and kind of take mental notes about when it's really working. Mm. Yeah, that would be my advice. That's really good advice, really good advice. Now, you mentioned about, you know, you started moving away from close up, you started doing uh, sort of stand up shows and, and, and then transitioning into cabaret. A question I get all of the time on this channel is how can how can a performer that's watching this transition from close up to stage in a couple of different ways? One, how do you find those opportunities to do that? But two, from a nerves point of view, I think the big thing that stops a lot of close up performers moving into stage is the nerves or at least that's what i found with people commenting on this channel because there's a big difference between going up to five or six people at a wedding and going hey let me show you look it comes to the top of the deck there's a big difference between that and walking out cold on stage to hundreds of people there's a massive difference and i remember when i interviewed john archer on this channel he said you can tell you're good when you go out on stage and you can walk out onto stage cold and not do close up beforehand. So, you know, it's a lot easier yeah. to do close up and then you go on stage. But when you can walk out on stage cold and win them over, that's when you've got it. So, I suppose my question is threefold. One, how do you get to that level? How do you cope with nerves? And, and how do you find the opportunity? Or how did you find the opportunity? There's a lot of questions there. Yeah, yeah. So, uh, let's take them in sequence. So, uh, coping with nerves, I get very nervous. Uh, you started talking about it then. I could feel that, you know, that sort of horrible feeling in your chest. Mm get it like uh also i don't know if I'm, i remember writing about this once in something but i think it's long since not published anymore but my hands like visibly shake if i'm nervous like i'll seem very calm but if there's like if someone has to look at something in my hand like it is shaking i, I, I can't i don't notice it until i see my hands shaking it's just an unconscious thing to happen that happens um so that was very odd i don't i can't really i don't know how i deal with the nerves i think it's it's the main thing for me now is experience. I know, you know, I know it's going to be successful. Successful. If I'm doing 20 minutes on stage, I know this routine at the end and this routine at the beginning. This is as good as I can make this routine. This is as good as I can make this routine. Hope for the best. Uh, it is just experience that helps you dampen the nerves, but the nerves never really go away. If I'm doing something new, new material, or if I'm, if it's been a big break, like it has been recently <laughs> of performing, I'm going to feel really nervous, even though it's a routine I've done a thousand times. I'm going to be like, what if, what if I've forgotten? What if it's gone? What if, whatever it is that makes this work has just vanished from my body and brain. Um, but I do know people do certain, I think it comes from um, doing that amateur dramatics when I was younger. There was someone who was in the group who was a proper stage fright. She was genuinely terrified, but she was always great on stage. And uh, she just sort of, but always before the show, just be absolutely like, almost like she's hysterical, but just quietly to herself. And then as soon as she went out, she was great. Never fluffed a line, never, she just seemed to enter into a different state and then it was entirely different. And she also, I remember her saying as well, I was quite young at the time, but I remember her saying she just doesn't remember the show. Like she doesn't remember. It's like she goes into some sort of trance and she's on stage, but she was really good. 
But another friend of mine who is a musician, she never ever says that she's nervous. I've never heard her say that. She always says she's excited. And I think I, I think she's just interprets the nerves as excited. Because the reason you're nervous is you don't want to get it wrong. And not necessarily because it'll make you look stupid or it's because you want these people to have a good time. Like, you know, you're performing this trick because you think this trick is really good and uh, something about it that you really like and you want to share that with a room full of people. So you're not nervous about looking stupid. You just get, you feel nervous about the fact that you might sort of not let them have that wonderful experience. And they want that experience as well. They don't want you to be bad. Even if you're having a, you know, those Christmas parties that we mentioned where they're a bit rough and they're a bit shouty <laughs> at some events, uh, they still want it to be good. They still want you to have a good time. But to get into it, I did what you just mentioned, which was started offering an after dinner thing or a stand up thing after having done close up. So I can walk around for an hour and then how about I do 20 minutes on stage before you do your award ceremony or whatever they might be doing for their event. So that's when I started to find the material that works. And also, don't, I did this wrong early on. Don't write a show. If you're a mentalist, you kind of feel like mentalism is a show thing. I should book a theatre locally and just do two hours. <laughs> you're not going to do that. That's a terrible idea. I tried it when I was much younger. I didn't do two hours. I did about half an hour and it was embarrassing. <laughs> but you should start with smaller sets. Just get yourself on stage somewhere. Like there will be, if you're in a town or a city, there will be open mic things for comedians or poetry or... In, uh, I live in Norwich and there's all sorts of events for the way pre-pandemic where it's mostly a comedy night but someone can get up with a guitar and sing a song or uh, there's even um, some poetry happens and stuff and if you come along going hi I'm a mind reader or a magician or whatever can I just do five minutes but it was a really cool trick and they'll be like yeah that sounds great and don't expect to be paid but you know you get the time on stage to be like ah oh, yeah I think this is really I think this is really good and I, oh I liked how I made them laugh then and then you'll find your personality and it will build up and then you'll just start to feel more comfortable. But essentially, to get over the nerves and to get onto stage, you have to kind of just get over the nerves and just get on stage. Just find the opportunities that you can. But if you're already doing close-up magic, the best way is to try and sort of upsell, I guess, doing a stage performance or a platform performance or a stand-up performance after your close-up work. And then um, if you find events or shows that are variety shows, put yourself on the bill there, then you'll uh, you know, have a good solid little 10 minutes or five minutes or whatever, and just keep doing that in a few different venues and you'll start to do more. And then other opportunities come from other opportunities. Like we know there's some close up magic, like you do an event for someone, someone takes your business card, six months later, you get an email or a call saying, hi, I saw you here. Could you come do this event? Yes, I can. And it just builds and the same thing happens on stage as well, if it's cabaret or if it's events you know if you're doing a corporate event somewhere or a company dinner then that person's wife might be there who also works at a different company who can then book you for that event uh yeah just slowly slowly is what it needs to be also fringe festivals because then you have to write an hour you have to make an hour of material and there's various sort of free fringes and that sort of stuff well i want to i want to talk to you about the the fringe in a minute um because i know you've done the edinburgh fringe but before I do, let me ask you one more question. On, 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 uh, we've talked about developing a character. We've talked about dealing with nerves. We've talked about performing on stage. One thing that I see in magic and mentalism is some uh, uh, basically people doing the same stage act. And what I mean by that is, okay, the opening is Richard Osterlund and then they're going into a Max Maven routine and then there's a Mark Spellman bit and then there's a Mark Paul bit. Oh, and they're finishing off with Bill Abbott. And yeah. <laughs> And it, it's, you know, it's, it's just, you, your show is very unique. It's very you. Um, I suppose my question is, the easy way is to just buy a load of marketed tricks and go, right, that's what I'm going to do. Yeah. The hard thing is to do what you've done, which is like, well, okay, I'm going to create my own thing. How would you, how, do you have any advice on actually going down that route and, and actually kind of creating your own, no, I don't necessarily mean creating your own tricks or maybe, but just kind of making a, a show. You've talked about putting a show out there, but making a show, because you know as well as me, you take something to the fringe and you get in front of an agent. If you're doing the same marketed tricks that everyone else does, you know, take magic as an example. If you go out there and do the vanishing bandana, 
that that agent's not yeah. they've, they've seen that a million times before doesn't matter how well you or amazing you do at your own spin they're just like i've seen that yeah yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah. It's the best vanishing bandana performance in the world they're looking for a new thing they don't want to go backwards they want to go forward so yeah. how have you been able to do that or you know have you got any tips um, how to actually it's a good question actually i think it comes from i've always like this phrase i think it was um eugene Berger. That writing about you know creating your own style or something saying it normally start it should start negatively so you look at stuff that you don't like like i don't like uh don't pick on anyone's routine uh, ashes on ashes on arm you know when you mm -hmm. take something and it appears on your arm it used to be cigarette ash but now it's whatever is <laughs> around i can't stand that trick i <laughs> just i really don't like it it's not for me so i don't perform it um but uh that, i kind of thought why don't i like it what, what is it about me that means i just don't like that trick and i wouldn't do it so once you deconstruct why that might be, it's like, I think, um, so I want my abilities as a mind reader, whatever the fake abilities I have to come from sort of me, from like studying esoteric stuff secretly, having lots of information in my head, being able to read people, second guess people, uh, sort of tricking them slightly as well. So if I'm gonna reveal something, I don't want it to sort of manifest on my arm because I look at that and go like, we've put a glue stick on your arm and you've rubbed some stuff on it. That's not, it doesn't really suit me. <laughs> So, so I want it to come from a place that would come from me. So I'd write it down, if that makes sense. And like I also don't really like predictions when it's pre-written. Like if I came out with an envelope and saying, this is going to stay here it's to the end of the show. I kind of prefer a prediction if I meet someone and go, uh, I'm going to ask you to do something, but wait one second. And then give it to them. I write it in the moment as if it's it personal to them. Otherwise, it just kind of feels like this happens every night. You know, it's just in a box. It's always the same. Don't worry about it. I just realized certain things about how I want things to look. So it means I didn't like certain routines. Like I didn't like, like I love a, a bank night routine, but it kind of it just kind of drags on a bit. And it and as it dwindles down, it should get more exciting because now it's 50-50. That's really exciting. It's either going to be right or wrong. It's a, it's a toss of a coin, like what could happen now. But if you're starting with five, the first person picking it's like, well, it's not going to be me, is it? That's not going to have the money in. So statistically unlikely. So I got rid of all that. And I just a 50-50 version, which is the transfer gimmick. And it just feels a bit more organic. Because it's just like, it's either this or this. If you get it right, you win. Nice and simple. Yeah. Um, and what I did find doing that is it means I, I hacked a lot of stuff out of routines. Like I have a, well, we all know what a three envelope test is, or fourth dimensional telepathy, as Anaman called it. Uh, but Cassidy calls it the three envelope test. Brilliant routine. Um, I love it and we all know how it works, but um, it's just three, three really bothered me. I feel like three really sh shines a light on how the trick is working because <laughs> you have to do something twice. Um, that shouldn't really make sense. So I just cut one off, just made it a two envelope test, which means the method has to change and, the, and everything, but it's much more direct now. It just looks like mind reading. It's like, oh, I found where I wanted it to be. Mm -hmm. In terms of, Creating your own stuff. I guess you're right. It's easier just to buy the show that everyone does. Like Romanticism show, it's probably tossed out deck to start with. Then um, Larry Becker's uh, Sneak Thief or Maven's Desire. And then a box of the prediction in the end. That's normally a mentalism show. <laughs> but if you just go out there and do that for a bit, like I uh, used to do tossed out deck. Um, but then I thought, I don't really like tossed out deck. What can I do? And then I came up with this whole routine called Never Play Cards with the Mind Reader, which does have people in the audience sit down if I named your card, but that's now become a memory routine and there's 26 of them. So I just, I just changed things slowly and I realised that's not an opener anymore, so that has to go in the middle of the show. What do I open with? Well, I was doing the mind reading three envelope test here, I've cut that middle out there, so I've put that at the beginning. Yeah, that goes there now. And you just slowly change things. So I changed my three envelope test into a two envelope test because it's so strong and and, and direct now, that goes at the beginning of the show. Yeah, just over time, you change the bits, you know, the book test is very easy to do on stage if you buy the expensive books and you've got a good 10 minutes of doing some mind reading, but you might realize that you don't want it just to be from the books. So then maybe you look into billet work and then you go from there and you build your own routine. But I'd say start with just buying the tricks off the shelf and putting your own style and presentation on them. And then slowly over time, you'll change them. You'll adapt and modify until it doesn't look like the trick that you were doing before because it's now your routine perfect that's that is really 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 great advice it really really is <laughs> uh, that's great and let me ask you um one more question when it when it comes to mentalism um 
this is the age old question, I think, that divides mentalists. And I bring it up because I've, I've been speaking recently to my friend Steve Della, um, who, who talks about this and is very passionate about one particular way of doing things, which is propless versus props. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> What's your thought process on this? Because. I, uh, yeah. So uh, did, you would have seen, is this in the cocktail download? I, I'm into prop full mentalism. It's my own phrase of having stuff like this is what my house looks like. I love all this like stuff everywhere, like um, and I like vintagey cases and stuff, and I like objects that are interesting. Uh, I still want it to look clean. I don't want it to look like the objects are doing the trick for me. But if I have a, a Malloy prediction box thing, I don't want the metal one. I want the wooden one. And also, I'm going to take some boot polish to it to make it look a bit older. It's an aesthetic choice to have all these props. But uh, but when we talk about props or when we talk about propless mentalism, we're talking about a sort of a method, a methodological method, a procedure. And I, uh, don't, I'm just gonna say, can't stand them. Absolutely hate them. <laughs> it's, just, it's just thinly disguised guesswork. It's like people have read psychological subtleties and completely misunderstood. <laughs> And also, if you do it, like I do, you, I know you know, have a lot of work on the invisible deck, mm -hmm. and you would have done over the years. You've probably asked a million people to name a card, and they've named a card. Mm -hmm. Have you ever noticed a pattern, really? We, we all say not Queen of Hearts, the Ace of Spades, because those do come up a lot, but I cannot spot a pattern. You might in the room at the time, I've been in a room where I'm like, people keep naming spade uh, court cards. That's really strange. Just keep happening around the room. And, and so much so, I'm getting paranoid, I go like, are all these people talking to each other? Just a mess with me. But there is no, no one always thinks the same thing. Or when people are guessing a name, you can guess a name as long as it's Tim, Tom, <laughs> Adam. <laughs> it's like, great. But what if those people don't have very Christian or Catholic names or they're not short? It's like, what are you going to do? You can no longer do a trick. I like them as little extra bits, little subtleties to things. Like, um, as we keep coming back to 1914, because I work with them so much, Fraser Parker's original. True Mysteries thing, it's got some brilliant things in there. There's one where you make someone not be able to talk anymore. It's the illusion that you're creating. And I used to put that in with a routine in which I erase their memory. So it becomes part of the process of erasing their memory that they can't talk anymore. So they're a bit weirded out, but they still got the effect of when they look at the cards again, I'm like, oh wait, but to the audience, it looks like I am scrambling their brain right now. But I think just on its own, that is a great routine that, but I think just on its own, those little propless routines of, you know, just guessing where, where a coin's hidden and maybe a card they're thinking of or something. It's, it's too interested in the method than the effect. Because like if I go up to someone and say I'm a mind reader and I do a billet routine, so like write down, write down the name of your someone you've not thought about in years and I tell them that name, they're like, wow. But if I go like think of a thing of one of these things <laughs> and then and I kind of vaguely eventually get there, they're like, ah, cool. <laughs> Yeah, I completely agree with you. Yeah, they all look like elephants in Denmark to me. <laughs> so it's like it's the same sort of thing. I enjoy them as an, like, I love creating ideas and methods and stuff, like being creative. And they're always quite interesting, but I never really see a, an application for them. It's like how instant stooging was really popular years ago, wasn't it? Mm -hmm. Yeah, it was. Using clever linguistics, but then eventually it just became. The old fashioned thing of like taping a five pound note to a thing saying, be a sport and name the seven of diamonds. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Absolutely. Now, I'm, I'm, I, every mentalist I've spoken to, I I'm trying to find a propless mentalist that advocates propless mentalism because <laughs> I've spoken to I've spoken to you. I've spoken to Spellman. I've spoken to Chris Cox. I've spoken to Dave, um, uh, uh, Steve Della, and they all say the same thing. You know, why would I not want to use a prop? It's going to be the best way to achieve what I'm trying to yeah. achieve. It's like I, I used to be sort of against book tests just because I, I didn't want it's too easy to go like to say stop and then all the even though they're brilliant, lots of them are brilliant versions, there's even really well hidden versions. I was sort of against them for a long time until I just bought some, the classic ones, you know, the flashback ones, and started using them. I was like, this is great. <laughs> this is so much easier. Uh, as, but because I've already put in the work of Billet work and other stuff, um, it kind of feels better. It's too easy to rely on that crutch. But also, I wouldn't, we were talking about nerves before. I'd, I'd be extremely nervous if I'd walked out on stage. I had nothing in my pockets. <laughs> and then someone had said, like, Alex Maglia, mind reader. And I came and I was like, 
I have a vague idea that some of this might work. <laughs> it's like, that's, I'm not going to have a good time. <laughs> yeah, I totally get what you're talking about. And you've mentioned a few times there about billet work. And mm. you, although you do a lot of mentalism, and we're going to talk about products later on, um, you 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 do a lot of like you've got a two hour download on billet work yeah you obviously spent time um the cocktail routine which reference that you brought out through 1914 although not billets it's a center tear yeah uh, it's, it's an amazing version of the center tear and the presentationally you've really made it your own i absolutely love the presentation in cocktail i think it's brilliant i was so bought into it when i was watching that performance um what made you move towards billet work? Because you don't see many mentalists doing that. Most mentalists mm. do what you said. They'll have a box on stage hanging from the stage. <laughs> they'll, they'll have a master prediction. They'll have uh, envelopes or chairs laid out or whatever it may be. Yeah. Um, there was, before, like, there was a time when, like, and especially in Edinburgh, there were so many mentalists. You'd sit down to watch the show and, like, there's four chairs in a row and a box hanging from the roof. Right, of course. Which one am I watching? Oh, yeah. <laughs> Which is like, those people are great. Those are great shows. I've seen people do amazing things with those. And the audience like it. It doesn't matter what we think. But, you know. Uh, yeah, I love Billet Stuff because it, it, it means I'm able to do what I want to do. I kind of, you know, creativity comes from restriction. And also, I think the best mentalists restrict themselves to a certain type of thing. Like Geller, he does drawing duplications and spoon bending. But his is all about, he's all about energy. Energy moves into the spoon. He does anything to do with energy. That's his vibe. Power through the screen. Um, but uh, he's restricted himself to those things. Like you're not going to see him doing. Uh, he's not going to do a magic square. You see, he's not going to do. He's not going to do Malloy prediction chest or any kind of prediction really. If he does, he'll sort of hell headline style. But he doesn't really do that anymore. So he restricted himself. So a long time ago, I decided I'm a mind reader. I read minds. So a lot of my predictions uh, are reframed as me reading someone, but maybe before the show. Like there's a clip on my YouTube channels called people watching and it's a prediction because i predicted a word that someone's going to think of but it's framed as i watched this person before the show i wrote down a description of them and things about them and i predicted the word they're going to choose right now from their own mind so it's kind of reframing it uh to suit what i wanted to be so to be just to be a mind reader and billets means it's just the most direct form of mind reading without it being restricted by like if it's a book it can only be a word or a name from the book, maybe, but it has to be something from that book. But if it's something personal, I wanted to do, you know, tell them the name of their first kiss, or, or you know, think of someone, a place they've been, or want to go to, or even a, a memory or something like that. You want that spooky moment where you're apparently describing something that's only inside someone's head. Uh, yeah, that's what that's what drew me to billets, and it is. Um, it's also a tactile thing. Like if you learn cards card magic you it's the physicality of doing it to be satisfying and making it look as clean as possible and visual as possible or whatever same thing as billets are like it's a tactile thing you can understand it and then kind of make your own or improve it uh yeah i just really love billet work <laughs> and, and you know what you, you, yeah i mean the download that you've got that discusses it i mean you go into absolutely everything don't you you go into it yeah you? there's even like a full routine i did it for in my that time I went to the fringe show in there and that started the idea of we see a bowl full of billets or forks for QA. It's like, what what else can you do with it? So I sort of just sat down and tried to think of extra things to do with it. And there's a whole routine in there which is we just use the billets on the bowl. And at some points in the show it's just picked random people out, but then it became like a random person selector for a different routine. Yeah. That's amazing. Now you talked about um uh the, the, the fringe would you say going back to your career you've done close-up you started doing more stand-up shows uh you started offering stand-up as an option after close-up then you transitioned into more um uh, cabaret style places and things like that we obviously know that you've done a lot with the champions of magic mm. did how did we get to that i mean because obviously that's a huge deal was the edinburgh fringe part of that was it being in the right place at the right time because let's be honest so many people want to want to be on a big touring show like that i mean what you've achieved yeah. right now, it's the ultimate goal of pretty much every magician and you know yeah. I, I, especially I, mentalists I, as well like it feels like that's where you want to be on you want to be on a big stage being a mentalist yeah 
exactly. And uh, so, so how did that? All, how did the Champions of Magic thing come about? And you know, wh- how did you get from where we are to to there? Um, so um, it wasn't directly as a result of the Fringe. I had already done a couple of the early Champion shows before the Fringe, but with the Fringe, as you probably know, you book it so far in advance that you don't really know what's happening in between. But um, also when I did the Fringe, I did the free Fringe, I only did like a handful of shows in a tiny room that was extremely hot as well. So I didn't do Edinburgh Fringe, like, you know, Chris Cox has done the Fringe properly, big venues, one of the big four or five venues, and so is Colin and stuff. I did a teeny weeny, but by, after, the, after that, Champions sort of took off, so I didn't, I didn't have time, basically. <laughs> but um, I, the reason Champions came around is because <clears throat> There was like a variety competition style show somewhere. Um, and it was very much in the vein of Britain's Got Talent, but it was more sort of localised. And I did that just to be, um, just because, you know, it's an opportunity, could either win some cash money prizes, I think, or just felt like a good idea to do, but it wasn't Britain's Got Talent. Um, and then the person doing the pyrotechnics and the confetti cannons at the end is involved with champions. So when the idea of Champions of Magic came up with those people, uh, he asked magicians he knew, he'd worked a lot with, uh, he booked a lot of comedy acts for, for comedy venues. So he worked a lot with Pete Verma and that sort of stuff. So he wanted to book them and asked other people, like, who's good at this, who's good at this? Do we know any mentalists, blah, blah, blah. And the, and the, and the person um, who was doing the pyro and the techniques went, I saw a mentalist, he was pretty good actually, but funny. Okay, so I got an email, do you wanna do this? I was like, yes, so I did one. And then, uh, then I did another one because early on in Champions, it was a sort of trying out different performers before it became a, a certain cast. And yeah, I just did a couple of them and thought nothing more of it. I thought that was fun. I hope I get to do more of those. And then not long after that, it just became a, we're doing 10 dates around the UK. Going to go on a tour bus. There's going to be this. We'll make sure the bigger. So can you come up with a new second act, second half routine that's kind of 20 minutes long? So we developed that and it, and he said, how about a Malloy prediction thing? I was like, no. <laughs> so then we used, I said, there's this big chalkboard one that um, Copperfield used in the 80s or the 90s. So we got one of those and we used that. Um, but yeah, we just developed it from there. And then the, just the ball rolls and then we went out to America, back and forth and back and forth. But in between those, very early on, I think it's 2014, I went to the Fringe. And then a couple of years later, 2016 and 2017, I went to Australia to do the Perth Fringe World Festival because a lot of the bigger fringy acts from Edinburgh and stuff will go up to Australia because you start at Perth and then you can go down to Adelaide and then you can go to Sydney. You sort of have to prove yourself. So we went for one year to Perth. I uh, got like nominated for an award, which is pretty exciting. And then we just went back again the next year, for the same show plus a new show because we realised if we do two shows, it might actually make some money. <laughs> so I did a, like an evening show and then a later show. And that was a good experience. Um, but yeah, it was but then but then champions are sort of that was before we started touring then North America. When that happened, it just the diary gets full then. <laughs> so then you become a lot busier. Well, uh, obviously you were doing champions with Young and Strange, right? And yes. Yeah. And I've I've interviewed Richard Young on this channel and and he, he talks about how his schedule is just so busy. It's just yeah, he's, he's just like all over the place. He doesn't have time for anything else other than to go and perform. Uh, so we've got the uh, schedule for the next you know, 18 months, two years or so. And it's we're going to be very busy. <laughs> there goes a cat. Uh, we're going to be super busy, but it feels like that's fine because we've had about 18 months off. So I'm doing literally nothing. Uh, so yeah, I'm looking forward to it. There's one question with Champions of Magic. Do you find it difficult being the mentalist when it's billed as Champions of Magic or is that not an issue? Like, that's not I'm turned yeah. off expecting the whole young i mean because young and strange on those shows they just go above and beyond right the stuff that, you know, it's just insane the stuff that they bring along i mean you're there with your uh your billets and they're there with <laughs> just getting ready for the show guys there we go <laughs> ready <laughs> um, they're polishing crow <laughs> checking, checking things uh, uh, oh dear yeah, okay. it, it, it must it have been hell out of them <laughs> <laughs> um it is, it was initially, I think it never came from me, but I think like, Youngie's always like, when we do stuff together, the past couple of years, we've got a few routines in the show that we all do together, because we all got our each, he's got our own disciplines. I'm the mind reader, kind of strangely, 
illusionists, as close to a magician and an escapologist. Uh, so we're kind of defined by our genres, I guess. Whereas like a lot of the ensemble shows, there'll be sort of three guys that do kind of the same thing. <laughs> and then we're like, oh, okay, this one's come out with a box and is doing something with a box. And now this one's doing something with some cards. And that one's doing some stuff with cards now. We try and keep it kind of separate, but we've got stuff we all do together now, uh, which is really nice. But it did become a problem of like, if we all stand around while something appears, oh, what's the mentalist gonna do? Other than just stand and point. Because <laughs> I can't take any credit for the, you know, the car that appears, because it's like, what did he think it there? <laughs> what did he do? <laughs> but it's not really, I guess, because it's under the umbrella of Champions of Magic. There's stuff, I, in my head, it's stuff that the show does. The show is, you know, if, if we sudden, if we all, all five of us appear at the beginning of the show, bang, bang, or vanish. Uh, it's the production, it's the show itself that's doing that. It's just a general mystery. Whereas when it comes to me and what I'm doing, I do have slightly stricter rules of stuff I will and won't do. So, so it makes sense. Like it would be weird if I did my ambitious guide routine in the show. Because like, isn't he the my reading guy? What's going on? Yeah, that makes that makes total sense. <laughs> <laughs> Here's a question for you. And, and I'm really, uh, really interested in this. So we know you as a creator of mentalism as well. Over the years, you've worked with Penguin Magic. You've worked with, obviously, uh, recently you've been doing a lot of stuff with 1914, uh, but also you've self-published routines and, and, and so on and so forth over the years as well. My question is, what made you decide to do that? And what I mean by that is... By any definition, you have been a very successful performer. You are at the top of your uh, industry. Even before you got involved with Champions, you were performing at a very high level. You are considered one of the top mentalists in the country. But obviously, since Champions, I mean, you're 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 with your part of one of the, you know, the most popular touring shows in the world. What? Why? Why did you? Why did you start releasing mental? I mean, you don't need to. It's not like, <laughs> it's not like you're, you're saying to your partner, "Well, you know, we need to pay the mortgage this month, love." Uh, I don't worry. I've got an ESP deck. I'll bang that out. It's all good. <laughs> so, what, what made you decide to go down that route? And you've just um, said how busy you are doing all of this. Stuff. It's true. Like, you know, like a lot of more recently, about the stuff I released, like you did mention the ESP deck. I do have an ESP deck out and. The billet lecture you spoke about, the two-hour one, that was made in lockdown last year, like May or something. It was initially for a different project, but then I just put it out myself. Um, but yeah, that was just you know something to do to make a two-hour video and edit it all, and because I've been making videos before, blogs and various other stuff. Uh, so that was something to do. And the ESP deck uh, is an idea I've had at the back of my head for ages, because one of the main things about it is it, there is wavy lines, but there's also a triangle. Because I don't like wavy lines in the deck, so I did a triangle. So I thought I should just make them. I should just get them printed. And I got some printed. I thought I could probably sell these because I think other people would like this as well. So then I just started to sell them. But yeah, that was this year. But they're all ideas that have been in the back of my head for ages. But I have published stuff beforehand. And I don't know why. I do like sharing. I come up with a lot of ideas and material. And sometimes I sort of use them for a bit and go, nah, that doesn't, doesn't quite work for me. Or it's, I like, I like the sort of, exercise of trying to come up with something to do with sweets for example or tarot cards or esp cards and just thinking what can i do with this maybe this maybe that maybe something else like with tarot cards i don't do readings the super spooky tarot idea doesn't really suit my character or style but i was just intrigued by the idea of what can i come up with that works with tarot cards maybe this maybe that maybe this and because it doesn't i can't i'm it's no point me guarding this secret for no reason other than just sort of ego i might as well publish it out there and make a little bit of money from it as well especially when i work so close to the 1914 uh d used to work a lot with the penguin magic guys as the as their their man in the uk so that's sort of how i got in with the penguin guys and uh yeah and sort of self-publishing things i'm not hugely well known i certainly wasn't until the penguin things so i'd release a book and you know the 30 people that buy my stuff would buy it and I'd be like, ah, there we go. I get a nice little email saying, oh, I love your, your lottery prediction. Oh, thank you very much. <laughs> it just kind of feels nice. But um, I don't know what it is, but I do like sharing ideas and routines. And the fact you can make a, a few quid from it as well certainly helps, you know. Mm -hmm. It's like if you, when you're a self-employed person, performer, or just self-employed, multiple revenue streams is always 
is the only way you're going to survive really without having a nine to five job. So like you are, you're a performing magician, but also you do, you do the YouTube, you do the podcast, like you mentioned, like there's all this, you've got to keep multiple things. Like you don't just do close up magic, you have stage acts and stuff. And like, I imagined you hire out your stage props to other people. That's another thing that I know illusionists do. Mm -hmm. uh, so yeah, you've got to have multiple revenue streams. But yeah, I do love sharing ideas and getting an email from someone. Like when the billet download came out, um, Mark Paul bought it. Like I saw his name come up on the thing. I was like, oh, Mark Paul, what do I think? And he sent a lovely email saying it was, he really enjoyed it. He thought it was fun and he really liked the ideas. I was like, huh, Mark Paul thinks that's good. That feels good. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that's, that's great. That's amazing. <laughs> that's awesome. Okay, so you've just said that your next two years are going to be super busy. You've just had your touring schedule for champions and they're working yeah. like a dog. Um, is, 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 is your output suddenly going to decrease for a while? Or... <laughs> it might do. I know with... Um, uh, I could still... Uh, well, also, these days, every, I, want, I, I as well want to buy stuff on video. Like, I love a book, I love reading an old book or a PDF. It's because it's a bit more convenient. But um, a lot of learning and a lot of stuff I've done is video teaching, video tutorials. And uh, that's often easier as the consumer as well. Like I'd rather pop on this 20 minute video to understand how this trick works or watch you know, a whole lecture or something. So it's definitely gonna be harder for me to do any, anything like that on the road. Um, but uh, yeah, I think it might decrease a bit, but like I'll still be selling things um, when I'm on the road, it'd be easier for me to post them to the US when I'm in the US as well. So that'll save me some money <laughs> and people from having to ship things from the UK. Uh, yeah, but there's a few things coming out in the future anyway. I've done another thing with Penguin, another lecture remotely kind of like this. And that'll come out in the future. Um, 1914 with the stagecraft, the art of stagecraft. We, we, we both, we all really want to do a, like a physical version, but not just a DVD. Because uh, I, I don't own a DVD player anymore, so no one's really no one's using DVDs. But I had this idea, and I think it's pretty cool to make it a physical product, which will also help and like add extra value to it. But also, it'll also give you the download as well. So we're going to work on that. But yeah, it might decrease for a while. But you know, this you call it like working me like a dog on tour. Like it's not really working. <laughs> Sometimes I have to get up early to do a radio interview, and that's that's as hard as it gets. <laughs> It's a tough life. <laughs> <laughs> That's awesome. That's brilliant. And and for anybody who's watching this, that and, and this is a question I ask a lot of people that have created their own magic to sell. Um, for anyone that's watching this that has a product that they're interested in selling and they've never actually gone through that process before, as somebody who's worked with Penguin, mm -hmm. continues to work with Penguin, worked with D. Christopher at 1914, and obviously also has self-published and self-released your own products. Is there any advice that you can give in terms of, of, of releasing magic tricks and uh, mm -hmm. or, or mentalism tricks and which way to go? I mean, if you could go back in time with everything that you know now and you've got your first product, would you do things differently or was it the right way to do things? Like, is it oh. best to do it for a company or is it best to do it yourself? I guess because well, if you go through a through a magic dealer or a company who produce it for you or sell it for you, you're not getting all of the profit from it. Like you get a, a royalty just to make sense everyone understands that with you know regular books that you buy when you buy a book from waterstones or something the author of that gets a teeny weeny slice and then it gets spread out um so but what it does do if you go to someone like penguin magic or even the 1914 or any of those of those spaces that produce stuff um a lot of them have like sort of open submissions or they frequently like they'll have someone you can send it to or you know someone that works with them and if they like it, they'll go like, this is cool. We should maybe chat to this person and find out what else they've got. Can we do this? Can we do that? Like I did a Penguin Live act, you know, the whole lecture thing. They go out to Columbus and you do a show and then you explain the show, we would buy it. But that only came about because I did one or two tricks with them. And they were like, do you have like a, would you do a live act? Have you got something you could do? And I was like, yes, I have. I can do this and that and other. Like, oh, great. Maybe we'll film this one other thing to sell as a separate thing. So it kind of, it snowballs like that. But initially I only sold stuff myself, like a self-published, uh, I don't know if it's still a thing, but lulu.com used to be the thing that everyone used to use, so you could have a physical book. But these days, PDFs are very easy to produce. They can be a little bit too easy to produce because they're, they're not going through a, a copywriter or a, an editor at all. They're not made, they maybe don't look very nice. It kind of feels like things are going back to when uh, K 
Kent and Nepo used to publish stuff and just have clip art in there and stuff like that. But uh, when I sold them myself, I didn't sell very many. And this, but this is back in the day when one person posting on the big green monster, the Magic Cafe, you'd get more sales because people would be like, oh, who's this? Click through that, buy that. <laughs> Whereas these days, if you want to sell to a bigger market, if you've got this really killer idea, especially if it's got gimmicks or props that need producing, that could either be produced by a big manufacturer or you could outsource it. You don't have to make them yourself and then sell them. Uh, go to one of the bigger companies and say like 1914, have connections all over the place. Like um, like the, 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 the I will be done, the tarot card that had to be completely designed from re, completely redrawn, printed, the packaging, all this sort of stuff. That's something I could never do or afford to do on my own. So going through them means it's a product that can go out there and be available to the market. But if it's, um, yeah, if it's a routine or a trick that requires a prop or a gimmick or it's a single thing, go to one of the big guys and that also build, gives you a, builds your name up slightly, you know, so then you can perhaps get a following of people who like your material. So then when you self publish or produce something, those people will buy it. Mm. That's and also, again. Yeah. Also it's old fashioned having, having a mailing list. This is something I've always avoided because I hate mailing lists in general. But for something niche like magic or mentalism or one creator, email's the easiest thing rather than following, setting up a different Instagram or a different Twitter or like if I had an Alexander Marsh Instagram, it would have nine followers and then I wouldn't bother posting on it anymore. <laughs> so just slowly I remembered I should make a mailing list. The reason I find out about people selling magic is because they it pops through to my inbox and I go like, oh, um, Bill Abbott's got a thing. I'll look at what it is, whatever. Yeah, 100%. Yeah. Awesome. Awesome. Completely agree with you. And it's nice to know that you are still going to be bringing stuff out, even though you're going to be busy over the next few years. That's, that's good to know. Can I ask you one other question? We're going, to, we're going to wrap this up soon, but I want to ask you a couple of other questions. And one question is something that's come up on the channel an awful lot. And I think this is something that you could probably give some advice to, which is with the Champions of Magic, you perform all over the world. And yet you have a family. Mm. how do you balance the time between the two i found this an awful lot i'm getting this question over and over again on the channel from professional magicians who have uh been busy working every weekend at weddings and whatever it may be and and they've just had a year and a half of they're stuck with their family the whole time yeah. And, and yeah and now they're kind of getting us an opportunity to open up again and they're kind of like well I don't know if I want to work as hard as I did before because yeah. how am I going to balance out that family time? As somebody who's been doing that, I know that your family is very important to you. And I also know that you travel all over the world. So how have you made that work for you? Because you obviously you have. It is like it is. It is and has been myself very difficult, tricky at various times. So it's just me and my partner and we have a son together who's 11, very almost 12. Um, so he's, he's bigger and older now. Like it was, it was one of those things like it's easier when he's much smaller because you know when they're just toddlers moving around or six or seven nights like, super easy you know he just goes to school comes back eats dinner goes to sleep gets up you know it's nice and simple so it wasn't so difficult when i'm away my partner could uh, look after him also go to grandparents you know he loves going to his grandmothers but it is really difficult the big chunks of time that i'm away um and, and past so this christmas that's just been this is the first time we've all been home for Christmas for two, three years. What we've done before is I fly them both out to wherever we are because we do the champions, we do a Christmas run. Like we were in Chicago, the Christmas run in Toronto before that, and Cleveland before that. So we're there for like two weeks over the holiday period. And obviously, no shows on Christmas Day. Um, so yeah, I've flown them out. That is obviously expensive. <laughs> so all that money I'm making, being away so much, a big, big chunk of it gets taken away for the return flights um so but yeah being home again for this big period of time has been great especially as my son's 11 it's a really good time before he becomes a grumpy teenager <laughs> but it's been really special and really nice to be home now christmas at home because we've not had christmas at home for ages but it was, was funny at christmas my son did say i kind of miss the adventure of you know uh, a hotel room Christmas, you know. Like last year, we I bought a tree. I shouldn't have done because you're not supposed to do that in a hotel. I bought like a tiny tree and we put it in. <laughs> well, I checked out, I just left it. But you know, <laughs> bit naughty. But uh, yeah, but it is difficult. It's hard to manage. It's hard to balance. But it is, you know, it's worth it because uh, of 
because it's my job and it's my income and it's how I have to do it. It's finding moments to be to come home for a brief period and go back again. FaceTime's good. Um, like I've had a few breakfasts or dinners with my son whilst I'm eating breakfast, he's eating dinner because we're time zone difference and we're just chatting over FaceTime like we're in the room together. Yeah, it's really difficult, but um, I think it depends on the person as well. Like it can lead to tension among partners, you know, because I'm sort of hogging all the all the me time because I'm not here and I'm not necessarily I can't put the laundry up because I'm <laughs> I'm, so, I'm really far I'm across the Atlantic Ocean so I can't do that I'm sorry <laughs> but yeah it's just sort of but my partner's also a performer as well she's a writer and a performer so she understands what it is I think it would be much harder if you're a performer and your partner is just has an office job you know they don't they don't understand the world of going out to perform and how difficult it is but also it's it seems like you're not doing much all of the day you put all of your energy of a day in that tiny space of time uh but she understands so uh yeah i don't know it's difficult but you just kind of come up with ways to cope and coping mechanisms and and things to make it easier basically but this has been like the as bad as it's like covid and everything is obviously awful but this it's been really good to have this time you know it's being locked down and stuck in the house it also means like I've done stuff around the house I've been meaning to do for the whole time we've owned the place. <laughs> well, there you go, that's a positive as well. Yeah, exactly, yeah. <laughs> I've learned like real skills, like putting in a plug and stuff like that. <laughs> that's awesome. That's brilliant. Well, you know what? One last question, which is, and this is a question I ask all of my guests, and um, the question is, what's next for Alexander Marsh or, you know, uh, Alex Bacalea, whichever way you want to look at it? What's, what's next? And what I mean by that is you have done so much in your career. You know, uh, you, you decided to be a mentalist, tick. Uh, you've traveled all over the world, tick. You're part of one of the most popular and largest touring shows in the world, tick. Um, you know, you've, you've bossed it on the, the fringe, tick. You, you've released magic, pro not magic, sorry, mentalism products, transfer, magic. You released magic and mentalism products that have been incredibly popular. Like I looked at transfer on Penguin and you're not a magician, but good God, it's like, this guy's a great magician. There's like four <laughs> five star reviews. It's like, I've released magic products and I don't get as many five star reviews as a magician. You know? <laughs> You know, and then and then all the stuff you've you know, I've, I've openly said it on this channel that the the art of stagecraft is the in my opinion the definitive best um, guide to performing on stage that I've ever seen. I've revisited it two or three times. So everything that you've done, you've been successful. Is there anything left on your magical bucket list, <laughs> mentalism bucket list that you haven't achieved? What what have you got planned in the future? I, uh, that's a good question. Also, I comes up a lot. I could do a lot of press for champions, or if I'm doing a show, and that is a question that often get asked, like, "What's what's next?" But it's like uh, I don't really. I just kind of want to keep doing it. There's no, there's no. I'm not really one of those goal-driven people. Like, I don't have like a, a mantra on the on the wall or a, a goals. I wasn't like one day I want to be at a touring show. One day I want to be this. Tick 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 tick. I just sort of ride the ride the waves as they come, like. Oh, this is interesting. I'll do this for a bit. Oh, it's going over here now. Um, but uh, I guess the obvious answer is like TV or something. But I don't really, I'm not really, I don't really want to make that magic show they keep making. <laughs> also, I don't watch TV. I don't have, like, it's not plugged in theater. <laughs> I watch what I want to watch, which is like Disney Plus shows, YouTube, whatever. I'd like to make video content that's for the public, but you have to have a following already before you can't, you can't build anymore. It's so strange. Like you've done incredible with this channel, but it's a very niche market because really? it's two magicians. It was like, it would be lovely to do that for the public, but the public don't really want to see magic or mentalism. They might do, they might, if it happens across their timeline, they'll watch it and go like, oh, spoke. <laughs> Whatever. Um, uh, but yeah, I don't know. I just riding the waves with it. The fact I get to, like the next couple of years are kind of planned out what's happening with champions like we're back in the us back up to canada to the uk europe back to the us go around maybe some more further afield destinations in a couple of years uh, around the world but yeah it's just kind of i'm not sort of one of those people that like i've done that now what's next so like i've climbed that mountain what's that mountain because i don't really think i've climbed a mountain i'm just sort of like well this is just sort of happening and i'm just sort of trying my best to keep going there and if it ends it's like okay that's what's this over here Kind of the same with releasing magic. Like I did it quite a bit many years ago 
and then occasionally released a few things, then released a chunk here, and then nothing, and then released a chunk here, because it's like, oh, this opportunity has come up, like the 1914 sort of relaunching, and I had such a great relationship with uh, Jack and Dee, that I came on board straight away, I was like, this is going to be great, I love everything about what we're going to do here, let's go. So let's ride that way, and like, I'm, I'm really enjoying working with them. I still do stuff with Penguin, because I love uh, the guys there at Penguin and stuff. So yeah, it's just no particular goals, but just keep keep on trucking. It's what I want to do. <laughs> That's the best quote ever. Just keep on trucking. <laughs> keep on trucking. <laughs> That's amazing. That is fantastic. I'll, I'll, t I'll tell you, Alex, this has been an incredible interview. I've been wanting to get you on the channel for a long while. Um, ever since I watched the Art of Stagecraft way back, I've been wanting to get you on here. And I've managed, thank you so much for finding the time because you are busy. You are a busy guy with your family and with your performing and you're only going to get busier. So I'm glad I managed to grab you before, you know, it, it's going to be impossible to. So thank you so much for finding time to come on the channel. I really appreciate it. That was a pleasure. I loved it. Thank you so much for inviting me on. Can I ask, what's the, uh, if people want to buy any of the products we've discussed, I know we've done a review show special in the past as well, but if anybody watching this that hasn't seen that, um, if, if people want to buy your products, um, you'll have a Shopify uh, website as well. Can yes. You what it is? But, yeah, if you go to um, alexandermarshmentalism.co.uk, it'll just forward you straight to the Shopify because the Shopify one is like Alexander hyphen Marsh hyphen mentalism dot Shopify dot com slash. And it's like, no, that's too much. <laughs> but Alexander Marsh mentalism dot co UK will just forward you straight to my um, Alexander Marsh store. Brilliant. And you are fairly active on Instagram as well. What's your Instagram handle? Uh, Alex the mind reader is the Instagram. Because mm -hmm. someone had already taken Alex Macbillier. He doesn't even post. Ugh. So annoying. <laughs> Yeah, Alex the Mind Reader sounds cool. I like that. Yeah, it's good. Yeah, simple, easy to remember. Yeah. <laughs> so that's going to be uh, so that's going to be there. That's going to be above the screen as well. So all of your products are available through that website, even the stuff out there. Uh, you know, the, the, the yeah stuff you've self published, but also the nineteen fourteen releases and everything is available from your website. Yeah, it? you'll see like the the sort of a, a montage of all the penguin stuff and a montage of all the um, nineteen fourteen stuff. That's just like a link through to the all my stuff on penguin, all my stuff on nineteen fourteen. Yeah. Great. So buy everything. If you are into mentalism, um, uh, please buy everything that Alex has brought out because all of it is incredible. And if you haven't already gone and checked it out, go check out the review show special I did on Thy Will Be Done um, when we talked about that and, and a whole bunch of other stuff as well. So please go and support Alex. But again, Alex, thank you so much for coming on the channel. I really appreciate it. And I wish you uh, continued success. Not that you need it because I know you're going to smash it. Thanks very much. Cheers, man. Take care. Bye, everyone. Bye.